Howdy folks, my name is Jimmy Aiken, and I've been asked to give you a talk answering two questions briefly. The two questions are, did Jesus exist, and can you trust the Gospels? So let's look at that first question, did Jesus exist? Now, uh, most people, in fact, virtually all scholars, uh, regardless of their religion, whether they're uh, Christians or Jews or something else, or even atheists, agree that Jesus existed. And that's why we find pictures uh, like this one of Jesus that have been painted all the way down through history. People have consistently recognized since the first century that Jesus of Nazareth existed. But you will find some people these days who argue that he didn't that uh, Jesus was just a mythical figure, and they have some interesting arguments. For example, one of their arguments is that Jesus is a mythological figure based on earlier mythological figures. In fact, you'll often hear that he's based on the Egyptian god Horus. And as evidence for that, they will point to things like this. Here we have a picture of Mary and the baby Jesus, and they'll say that this mother and child image is based on earlier mother and child images, like this one of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and her son, the baby Horus. Now, this is an interesting argument, and it goes further than you might suppose. For example, here is a picture of Victoria, the Duchess of Kent, and her baby daughter, who would grow up to be Queen Victoria, who ruled the British Empire for much of the 19th century. So the logic is fairly straightforward. Queen Victoria must be a mythological figure who's based on the mythological figure of Jesus, who's based on the mythological figure of Horus. And you can even see how Queen Victoria is based on Jesus. After all, she looks a lot more like Jesus than she does Horus. So we have a clear chain based on these mother and child images of mythological tradition. Now, I have a confession to make because we have even more recent mother and child images. This is one of me and my mother, Susan Aiken. So I'm afraid I have to confess, I'm a mythological figure. I am based on Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was based on Jesus, and Jesus was based on Horus. And so uh, that's just something you should be aware of. And it goes even further than that because we have more recent mother and child images, like these that I took off the internet. And as you can no doubt infer, all of the children in these mother and child images are mythological figures. They're based on me. I am based on Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria is based on Jesus, and Jesus is based on Horus. You can either conclude that or you could conclude that the reason we have mother and child images in cultures across the world and throughout history is because there have been mothers and children all across the world and throughout history, and merely having a mother and child image doesn't tell you anything about who's a mythological figure. Actually, now that I think of it, that last option seems to be the best one. So I don't think that the... Uh, mother and child images prove anything about Jesus being a mythological figure, but what evidence do we have that he actually existed? What convinces scholars of this? Well, we have a lot of evidence, but since this is a very short talk, I'll give you a simple arm's length argument that's easy to understand. Here we have a picture of the ancient Roman world. And one thing that everybody agreed on in the first century, whether you were a Christian or a Jew or a pagan, is that Christianity was a very, very new religious movement. At the beginning of the first century, there were no Christians anywhere in the world. But then suddenly, in AD 33, there is a Christian community operating in the Eastern Empire in Jerusalem. But they didn't stay there. The Christian movement began to spread rapidly, and just 17 years later, in AD 50, there were Christians in the Macedonian city of Thessalonica. And we know that because AD 50 was the year that St. Paul wrote his letter 
first Thessalonians to the church that he had just planted in that city. We also know that Christians were further west than that in the AD 50s, because in AD 59, St. Paul arrived in the city of Rome, and when he got there, there was already a Christian community waiting to meet him. So, Christianity spread very rapidly. It was in Rome by the AD 50s. It was also, of course, there in the 60s, and we know that because Roman historians talk about the fact that Nero blamed the great fire of Rome in AD 64 on the Christian community living in the city of Rome. We also have evidence that Christianity was even further west in the A.D. 60s. St. Paul talks about his desire to go and evangelize in Spain, and we have evidence that after his initial trial, but before his martyrdom, he was released and in fact did go to Spain and evangelize. So this raises a question. If we have Christianity beginning in Jerusalem in AD 33 and going all over the Roman world by the AD 60s, how did that happen? Well, we've mentioned the role of St. Paul as an evangelist. He was what's known as an apostle, but he wasn't the only one. There was a group of 12 apostles in addition to St. Paul, and they served as missionaries to carry the Christian faith across the Roman world. Now, at this time, travel was extremely difficult and dangerous and expensive. They did not have airplanes. They did not have trains. They did not have automobiles. They didn't even have steamships. If you wanted to go somewhere, you typically walked. Ordinary people, poor people, certainly didn't even have horses to ride. So you walked where you wanted to go. You were subject to bandits and harsh conditions from the weather. You couldn't count on finding good accommodations. Occasionally, you might take a boat, which could be very dangerous in the Mediterranean, particularly during some months of the year. So going all over the Roman Empire was not something ordinary people did. Most people lived in and around their home village and stayed there, basically. They might go short distances, but in no way was the ordinary person an international traveler. So what would lead these apostles to carry the Christian message all over the, all over the Roman world? What was it that drove them to undertake this dangerous, expensive, and difficult task? Well, it seems to me there's something missing from the picture as we have it. But if we think about it, we can figure out the answer. If you have a team of people who are carrying a message internationally, they need organization. They need someone who gives them a missionary mandate. And there we are. That person was Jesus Christ, according to all of the information we have. It wasn't anybody else. All of the sources, Christian and non-Christian, indicate that at the beginning of Christianity, there was a founder named Jesus of Nazareth. And according to our sources, he did indeed give the apostles a great commission, telling them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So we have a very coherent picture of why the Christian movement spread so explosively in just a few decades despite the difficulties. There was an original founder in AD 33, Jesus Christ, who then commissioned a group of missionaries known as the Apostles, and over 30 years they carried the Christian message all over the Roman world, resulting in converts or Christians in many places by the AD 60s. That means that we can take the undeniable fact that there were converts in the AD 60s and reason our way backwards to conclude that there must have been missionaries, a team of missionaries that carried the Christian faith across the Roman world. But if you have a team, a team needs an organizer, a founder, and that points to the existence of Jesus Christ. So, did Jesus exist the way people down through history have claimed? Absolutely yes. The evidence points to Jesus existing. So that answers our first question, but what about our second question? Can you trust the New Testament? Well, 
In the New Testament, and in particular, can you trust the Gospels, which are our primary sources of information about Jesus? Well, one question you might want to know about the Gospels is when they were written. You know, how long did the evangelists who wrote them have to preserve the traditions that they had about Jesus? It so happens I have an episode of my podcast, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, that's devoted to the question of when the Gospels were written. And so you can check that out. Now, here you see the Gospels presented in their canonical order, the order you'll find them in a typical Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you study the evidence, it becomes clear that they almost certainly were not written in that order. I've done a detailed study of the evidence, and here I've rearranged the evangelists in the order that the evidence suggests they were written. Mark was almost certainly written first, then Luke and Matthew, and lastly, John. But when were they written? Well, one set of dates that's fashionable holds that Mark was written around AD 65 or 70, a little over 30 years after the crucifixion. Luke and Matthew were written around AD 80, plus or minus 10 years. And lastly, John was written around AD 95, a little more than 60 years after the crucifixion. So this view, which is fashionable, holds that the Gospels were written between 30 and 60 years after the principal events they record. And that's not a long time at all. Uh, if you are an older person, like perhaps one of your grandparents, they can easily remember important events that occurred in their lives 30 to 60 years ago. And so it's not at all unreasonable that the apostles and their associates would be able to preserve the Jesus traditions for that period of time. But it so happens that I don't think that the Gospels were written this late. I think they were written earlier. I've done a detailed study of the evidence, and the evidence suggests that Mark was actually written around A.D. 55, about 20 years after the crucifixion. Luke was likely written in A.D. 59, Matthew around A.D. 63, and John around A.D. 65. So instead of being written over a 30-year time period, the evidence actually suggests they were written over about a 10-year time period between 20 and 30 years after the crucifixion. And if you are an adult, if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s, you can easily remember things that happened 20 or 30 years ago. So it's not at all impossible for them to have accurately preserved the Jesus traditions over this period of time. But that's not the only issue we need to look at. By the way, if you'd like more information about exactly when the Gospels were written and what the evidence points to, you can check out episode 140, of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, or even better, you can get my book, The Bible is a Catholic Book, which covers not only when and how the Gospels were written, but also how we got the entire Bible. Now, I mentioned that when they were written isn't the only question you need to answer, because even if someone writes recently, they can still do a terrible job if they're not careful with their sources. So that's another question we need to answer. How careful were the evangelists with their sources in writing the Gospels? Well, one thing we can show is that they displayed conscious care in handling their sources, meaning when they were trying to make a point, they didn't just make stuff up about Jesus. They handled the material they had carefully and distinguished between what Jesus said and what conclusions they wanted people to draw. Let's look at a good example of that. In the first century, the most controversial topic in the Christian community was whether you needed to be circumcised and become a Jew and observe the Jewish dietary laws and the Jewish feasts and things like that in order to be a Christian. Did you have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian? And we see that controversy in Acts chapter 15, where we read that some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And they ended up holding the very first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, which you can read about in Acts 15. But the controversy also shows up other places in the New Testament. For example, in Colossians, St. Paul is writing to a group of Gentile converts, and he says, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, meaning it's not a physical circumcision. If it's made without hands, it means God did it. God circumcised you. How? Well, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, and you were buried with him in baptism. That's what baptism is. It's the Christian ritual of initiation, which is the Christian equivalent of circumcision, the Jewish ritual of initiation. So baptism is the circumcision of Christ, or the Christian equivalent of circumcision. And so if you've received that, if you're a Christian— you're already in a relationship with God. You don't need to be physically circumcised and become a Jew. And so St. Paul says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. So you don't have to obey kosher laws. You can do things like eat pork. Or don't let people judge you in regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. And those were the key liturgical days on the Jewish calendar. The weekly, uh, the yearly festivals like Passover, the monthly new moons, and the weekly Sabbaths. And St. Paul says, look, you're already in a relationship with God. You have spiritual circumcision. You don't need physical circumcision. So you don't need to do these Jewish things like observing kosher laws or observing Jewish feasts. And he could be quite passionate about this. In the letter to the Galatians, he's writing to a church that has had people coming to it telling his converts, you need to be circumcised if you want to be saved. And he reacts very negatively to that. In Galatians, he at one point says, I wish that the ones who are disturbing you would also cut themselves off. That's literally what it says in Greek. He wants them to cut themselves off. What does that mean? Well, in context, it's pretty clear, and standard translations will give you a good idea of what he means. Uh, in, in the Revised Standard Version, for example, it translates this passage as saying, I wish that the ones who are disturbing you would also castrate themselves. So he's be, being really blunt about it. If they're such fans of circumcision, they should just go the whole way and castrate themselves. That's how passionately Paul feels about this. He's very, very blunt about it. So wouldn't it be nice if the early Christian community had some statement from Jesus that would help them settle some of these questions, like, do you need to keep a kosher diet or not? Do you have to avoid foods that were ritually unclean for Jewish people? Well, it so happens we have a very instructive passage in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark, some of Jesus' critics come to him and say, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat, according to Jewish custom? Because just like your mom told you, if you don't wash your hands, you could get, have some dirt on your hands, it could get in your mouth, and in the Jewish mind of the day, at least among Jesus' critics, that would make you unclean. But Jesus responds and says, Do you not see that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him? It won't make him unclean, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and so passes on. And I love that phrase, and so passes on. Here the translators are trying to protect your delicate sensibilities, because actually what Jesus says in the Greek is, it doesn't enter his heart but his stomach and goes out into the toilet. And they did have toilets in the ancient world. I've seen them at archaeological sites. You could also translate this goes out into the latrine. But one way or another, Jesus is being very clear about you're not made unclean by anything that comes into your mouth because it doesn't go into your heart. It just passes through the body. Now, what's interesting for our purposes is a comment that Mark now makes. Mark says, thus he declared all foods clean. 
Now, Jesus wasn't talking specifically about foods. He was talking about dirt, like you'd have on your hand. But his point that nothing that enters your mouth is going to make you unclean because it doesn't go into your heart would also apply to foods. And Mark draws out that implication. But notice how he does it. He doesn't attribute this as a direct saying to Jesus. He doesn't have Jesus saying, I hereby declare all foods clean. No, instead, he respects the integrity of the tradition he has of what Jesus did say, and he accurately preserves what Jesus did say, and then goes on to draw out one of the implications of what Jesus said. And that shows that he was displaying conscious care with his sources. He was not making stuff up about Jesus. He clearly distinguished between the Jesus traditions he was using as a source and his own conclusions when he was making a point. But we not only see the evangelists showing conscious care with their sources when they're trying to make a point, we also see them showing unconscious care with the sources, meaning they're careful with their sources even when they're not trying to make a particular point. For example, here is the famous incident of the feeding of the 5,000. It's a miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, but it's written a little differently with some different details in the different accounts of it. In John's Gospel, it begins this way. Then Jesus, when he looked up and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, where can we buy bread so that these people can eat? Well, why would he ask Philip? I mean, he had the whole 12 there. Why ask Philip in particular? Philip wasn't even one of the major, uh, one of the major apostles. He wasn't Peter or Andrew or James or John. So why ask Philip? Well, what else do we know about this passage? If we look in Luke about this incident, we read this, and he took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. Now the day began to be far spent, and the twelve came up and said to him, send away the crowd so that they can go into the surrounding villages and farms to obtain lodging and find provisions, because we are here in a desolate place. So we know that this incident occurred in a desolate place near the city of, or the town of Bethsaida. But still, why would Jesus ask Philip where to buy bread in this area? Well, if you look at the beginning of John's Gospel, when Jesus is first meeting the disciples, we read this. On the next day, Jesus wanted to depart for Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip, John says, was from Bethsaida. Suddenly, it makes sense why Jesus would ask Philip, where can we buy bread so that these people can eat? Because they were in the area of Bethsaida, and Philip was a local who had local knowledge of Bethsaida, like where you could buy food. So it all makes sense, but notice the evangelists aren't trying to make a point about this, and you don't get this picture, this coherent picture, by looking at any one of the Gospels. You don't get it by looking just at John or just at Luke. You need to notice details from more than one Gospel, and it's only when you do that that you see how the picture makes sense. And so even when the evangelists are not trying to make a point, They accurately preserve details that make sense when you step back and take a look at the whole. So they also showed unconscious care with their sources, meaning they were careful with them even when they weren't consciously trying to make a point. So let's review. What conclusions can we draw from what we've seen? Well, our first question was, did Jesus exist? And we've seen that the explosive growth of Christianity— between A.D. 33 and the A.D. 60s means that there were converts all over the place by the A.D. 60s when there were no Christians prior to about A.D. 30. And that means that those converts must have been made by an organized team of missionaries, 
who we know as the apostles, and those missionaries were given their missionary mandate by their organizer and founder, Jesus Christ. So Jesus existed. But what about the Gospels? Can you trust them? Well, regardless of whether you prefer the fashionable later dates or the evidence-based earlier dates, they were all written in the first century and not over a long period of time, relatively speaking. Uh, John being the last one written, whether he wrote in the 90s or the 60s, he could easily remember important events that had occurred in his life 60 or 30 years earlier. That's not a problem at all. Talk to your grandparents if you don't believe me. We also see that the evangelists took conscious care with their sources. They didn't feel free to just make stuff up about Jesus, which is why Mark preserved accurately a tradition of what Jesus said and then drew an inference out of it rather than simply manufacturing a statement to put on the lips of Jesus. We even see that they preserve details accurately when they're not trying to make a point, so they show unconscious care in handling their sources as well. And that means you can trust the Gospels. So those are the answers to our two questions, did Jesus exist, and can you trust the Gospels? Thank you very much.